the Wednesday week. It's blue, it's white, it's effing dynamite. Uh, yeah, I do that with some Kit Kat Chunkies and pretend I'm a dwarf. <laughs> Put four together. Uh, that, that was the first line I've said on Facebook, so that's fun, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, ignore the Kit Kat Chunky chat, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to another special Lockdown Live um, Wednesday week special. Uh, my name's Dan Fudge, and with me I've got Dave, Ben, Ash, Vic and Steve. And as you can see right down at the bottom there, star, one of the stars of the 1991 Rumbelows as it was League Cup final back then, Mr John Harps, ladies and gentlemen, he's here. <laughs> Is he uh, our sincerest apologies for coming on quite late? It was uh, it was Ash's fault. He was taking his beard off, um, <laughs> and if you saw it last week, uh, you'll understand why. Um, so, John, how's it going, pal? You all right? Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, you can be honest and tell him it was my fault. It was my fault. <laughs> uh, no, good. Everything's good. Great to be on with you. Uh, certainly. Uh, you know, anytime I, I get an opportunity to kind of go back many, many years ago with uh, the brilliant club of Sheffield Wednesday and the fans and the whole support and the Steel City and everything about it, um, it's it's always a welcomed opportunity from my perspective. So uh, happy to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to doing this once a week. It's going to be great. Mentally, it'll help me get through everything that I'm going through. Uh, but no, we're uh, we're good to go. I'm happy. Amazing. And may I compliment you on your excellent choice of attire. Thank you. And uh, as Dave said <laughs> offline, I would love to think that you wear this all the time. Oh, it's got the name on the oh, back. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh, look at that. Have you got one we knew you on? <laughs> it's the, uh, this is the official jersey worn in that, that game. What? Oh, no way. Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> see, and they thought I'd gone too far with my flags. You've got the shirt on. <laughs> you see it there on the bottom where it says below it. Oh my god! Oh my god. That's that's a, I'm about to tell you. You know, you I'm know annoyed you've not got it framed. It, it could still fit in it. <laughs> yeah, it could still two. fit in it. Mm -hmm. um, Barely. Barely. <laughs> Barely. 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 It makes it makes the guns pop, John. So yeah. uh, what we're gonna do? We're gonna uh, we're gonna go around the room. Ben, why don't you start us off, pal? Yeah. So let's start right from the beginning. Really, you're from you're born in Kearney, New Jersey. Um, yes. And yeah. that, is that now? I think it's now called Soccer Town, but obviously back then it, it must have been quite different with football not being, you know, the nation's number one sport. So, what was it like growing up as a someone who loved football, football where we are, soccer where you are? Yeah, it was, uh, it was certainly, um, it was interesting. And when I reflect back to those days, um, yeah, we did, uh, Corny, New Jersey was interesting. It was a, a lot of Scottish, English, and Irish immigrants that had come over uh, basically in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, um, looking for work. And uh, my mom and dad, my dad's from Dundee, my mom's from Paisley. Um, they didn't know each other, but they had actually met in my hometown uh, at a social um, you know, event that night. And... Uh, it, it seemed like it was like a little UK, like kind of town community in America at that time. And not a lot of people really experienced that. And where we growing up thought this is normal. Like we got the butcher shops, the fish and chips, which I worked at uh, when I was 14. And, um, you know, we go changing downstairs at the Scots American Club uh, with our youth clubs. And then uh, in the dungeon, which we called it, you're lucky to get out of there if uh, you were a young team. And, and we would go, you know, and support all the clubs on that day and all the age groups on that day with youth soccer. And uh, it just became like a normal thing for us. But it wasn't that case across the states. And as you said, um, you know, Soccer has grown tremendously over the years and um, we're still growing. It, it just is that. And I try to paint the picture for a lot of people by saying, um, I went over to Sheffield, what, God, two years ago for the 150th anniversary uh, celebration. And, but, you know, Major League Soccer here is in its 25th year. So if that, if that helps you keep anything in perspective of the history of the game here, there's a lot of history of the game. It just 
it wasn't structured. It wasn't at a professional level um, for continuous basis on year after year. It was such an inconsistency there. So when we went to look for leadership and everything in the game and, and what was happening, it was constantly changing that landscape. And so as a young, young kid and, and I was getting exposed and traveling back to Scotland and England and seeing my relatives and family and everything, I grew up like that was normal in every town in the States, but it wasn't. We played football every day. We did five-a-side pickup um, quite often, hours and hours, you know, a day. And I think that's what helps me grow as a young player and uh, have the passion for the game. Did you ever – so so being, you know, uh, in, in, in the States, you were probably quite ostracized, you know what I mean? You didn't play what they call football, you know what I mean? You, 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 did, you, did you find yourself involved in, in, in that sort of stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you do a little bit of everything. Sometimes I did. Um, I tried every sport. Um, I was, you know, I, I guess I was lucky enough to be athletic enough to kind of play all those different sports. And uh, uh, a lot of them bored me. And, uh, you know, football for me, I can I could tell when my dad gave me a, a kit to put on. When I was four. My, my, my older brother, Jimmy, who was um, he was six foot four, by the way, I, I was the run in the group. <laughs> um, he put me on the, on the pitch for like 15 minutes and I just grew a love for the game of soccer. I said, that's it. That's, that's what I want to do, you know, at a young age, but I played American football and played hockey. I ice skated as well. I played ice hockey, um, baseball for one year. Um, I fell asleep, uh, during, during the game as a baseball player. Um, we, we'll go into that later. I do like <laughs> cricket by the way. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you, you try everything like you do, but at the end of the day, it's like, what, what are you passionate about? What do you love? What do you connect to? And the, the game of, you know, football, uh, global football is what I really loved. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand you over to our, um, to our well, Scottish contingent, Dave, if you don't mind that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. you, you're in there. Oh, the full I'm Monty, here, yeah. Well, well, yes, I'm, well, well, this is it. I, I'm the Scottish contingent based on the fact I live... Not far from Glasgow, but not originally from here. But this is this is where I am now, John. So apologies for the accent. Um, no, you're all right. You're in the right. cultural center of the universe. You're okay. <laughs> so my wife tells me. Uh, I don't believe her. It, you, you made reference, John, and it's it's, it's quite interesting that you bring up the fact that the difference between you coming over for Wednesday for the 150th anniversary of soccer and MLS is just so it's 25th years. But um, the US has got this system set up where where sport is so fundamental through school and through colleges, universities, and, and if people have got an aptitude and a skill for it, it is really reinforced. So we, we fast forward to you, 23 year old John comes to Sheffield, you'll, you'll be exposed to that system of sport being everything. Um, what were your memories on what were your, 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 your recollections of the young British players coming through? Obviously you've, sport's been an important part of your life as it is for a lot of American kids coming through so how did how did the young English young British players coming through at Wednesday compare to what you'd expect from them was there the professionalism the attitude there or or was it a world of difference when you came over and you looked at your background to what their background was it's actually a great uh question uh we I was fortunate enough in Carney to get exposed to a lot of uh, Glasgow Celtic. Uh, they, they were coming over to Carney, New Jersey quite a bit and trailing, uh, you know, touring through New Jersey. So we got exposed to the U16 teams, U14s, U19s, the reserves would come over. I played against Paul McStay, Peter Grant, all these players when they were younger. Um, and I could not believe the amount of professionalism that they had. And that was one of the things that from, from a U.S. structure standpoint uh, and even playing in the World Cup and representing the U.S. in the World Cup in Italy in 1990 and then coming to Sheffield, seeing the younger players and the, uh, the apprenticeships that they went through, I had a massive um, uh, understanding and appreciation for that. And, and you saw players that were 15 and 16 with the desire to play and want to make that a career for them. Mm -hmm. uh, match that up with the professionalism and the discipline that was within the club system structure. I thought it was phenomenal. So a lot of talented players came through. I think what it came down to though, um, back in the day at that time was maybe the lack of opportunity, um, you know, for the younger British player, because as the game grew in the UK, so did it change with the foreign players. 
and how many were allowed to come in. Now that was a little bit later in that stage, but at that time, talented young British players. But it's interesting because just like in school and in teaching, uh, you learn through different stages and it's the same with teaching. You teach the game in different stages. So their methodology of teaching has to change and it has to keep up with the times. And I thought back in that day, there seemed to be one way of teaching the British player. And it was like, get stuck in, make sure you stick your passes. And there wasn't a lot of room for the creativity, mm -hmm. uh, which we, I grew up on in America where it was like, you know, you could do the back heel and the flick and the, you know, the, the bicycle or whatever, you know, overhead kicks and mm -hmm. things like that. The British player was like, uh, uh, do your job. Yeah. And, and I found that even in a talented professional approach at a young age, how mature they were at a young age, there was still that lacking of the, they didn't give them the platform to be that creative force. And I thought if they did, man, look out, it would have been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, from a UK standpoint, big time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Steve, I'm going to hand over to you now, brother. You've probably got some, some probers for us. <laughs> yeah, just, just before I ask my other question, just on that last point that you've made, when you mm -hmm. first came over, did you find when you're on the training pitch and you're involved in sort of practice matches and so forth, did you find find it easy did you how did you sort of transition from you know playing stateside where it's a little bit more liberal to you know the more regimented as you just said there you know was it easy to sort of fit in did you feel that you were a step ahead or was it just a totally different sort of experience for you I think it was a it was a bit of both I, I think from an emotional standpoint it was a bit frustrating because what you hear Steve, from the coaching staff is like, oh, just simplify your game and do it simple and do it like this. And I was saying, yeah, I did, but that didn't work. So I tried that. And I can remember Richie Barker, actually a game against, I think we played Oldham on the plastic pitch uh, away. And uh, I remember a ball came from Carlton Palmer and I had drifted centrally in the midfield and I bent a ball with the outside of my, my, my right foot about 35 yards over the right back onto, uh, I couldn't remember who was on the wing at that time. And he yelled at me and it was like a great ball. And I was thinking, what the F is wrong with this lad? And I remember just taking, he sometimes that type of structure, like you said, that question you just presented was like frustrating. Like, why would I show them and not disguise my past? Why would I show them exactly what I'm gonna do? instead of using the skill set to disguise it. So there were parts of that were a frustration, but the other part of it was getting that discipline in your game on a more consistent basis helped you stay at the high level. Mm -hmm. So the appreciation of that and gaining that into what you, what you needed as a player, not just as an individual, but positionally, what was being asked of you positionally. So from that perspective, it was kind of a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to ask, obviously, we, we've talked about a, a little bit of your sort of background in, in, in terms of growing up um, and, and coming over to the, to, to, to the UK. Um, talk to me a little bit about getting from the States into our sort of our footballing system. Um, I believe you had a, a couple of trials here and there. And what was it that actually got you to Sheffield and Sheffield Wednesday? Um, good story. Actually, I'll make it quick because I, I like to talk a lot, unfortunately. That's what my dog tells me. Um, so I was playing at Albany Capitals, which was not really a pro league, but it was kind of like a semi-pro league. And we did that in between the national team training camps. And so when we were preparing for 90 World Cup, we needed somewhere else to play. Albany Capitals was there. Jim and John Simpkins were ahead of that. And they kept telling me, you shouldn't be here. You need to go overseas, Hoxie. And I said, yeah, it would be nice. It'd be nice. And two weeks after that first conversation, they came to me and my, my, and my dad, they presented it to my dad and they said, look, we know somebody at Sheffield and uh, John can go over there and train, just get his feet wet, see what it's like if he wants to. And I said, sure. And I went over with Tony Miola in January. Um, Ron Atkinson liked me. He asked me to stay on until May. I actually told him no at that time. He thought I was mad. Um, I probably was when, when I reflect back on it. Um, but I did say to him, like, this is the first time we've qualified for a world cup in 40 years with the national team, uh, in the States. And I want to stick together with my team. And I think he kind of took that as like, wow, I was, that's more of a team player 
type of thing. So he liked that. He said he was going to be working the TV in the, in the World Cup. I think it was ITV or whatever. So he said, I said, yeah, great. If you like what you see, can you invite me back? And he thought, oh, pretty bold kid here. You know, I just asked him to stay on. And I, I honestly don't know why I was thinking that, to be honest with you. I, I, almost, I want to kick myself sometimes and bang my head against the wall. But I, it ended up working out. I came back, got a contract offered after playing three reserve games. Um, and I think it was over about 12 to 14 day spell. My agent at the time was Ian St. John. He said he thinks we could do better than that. I didn't really care about finances. I just wanted to get my foot in the door. But I listened to my agent, then went to Blackburn, and then went to Celtic, and then ended up taking uh, a train for six and a half or seven hours, whatever it was, with a big duffel bag, and my tail between my legs back to Ron Atkinson at Sheffield at the end of that. And uh, he made me work for it again. And, uh, you know, it was... At the end of the day, it was like I knew in my heart it was the best place for me to be. It was going to be where I was going to grow as a player, um, where the fan base was. It was a bigger club than what people thought after being relegated, um, you know, to the old Division Two at that time. And I, I thought with the talent that was there and the players and the personalities that we can really grow and do something special. Well, what, what was your relationship like with Ron? We've had a couple of people on in the last few weeks that have, you know, mm. given a little bit of insight regarding Atkinson. I'm just interested to hear what it's you... It's been mixed, thoughts. hasn't it? It's been mixed. It's been a, a bit of a John, mix for you, to be honest. John, Steve's being really polite there. <laughs> now, there's... There, there, you know what I mean? There, we, <laughs> we've had a couple I, of players come on. And uh, yeah. let, let me give you some background story. So, that you know, there, there's one story that sticks out with a couple of the players that played for Ron in the 90s that he would, you know, at the end of training, you'd play your inevitable small-sided game, and uh, Ron would want to play. You know what I mean? He, he used to... I, I think there was a story of him wanting his... or a bin bag, and uh, there'd, there'd be stories oh, of... I love uh, this one. This is a great setup. It's a great well, setup. I love it. I'm just going to leave you to it, John. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Drum roll, please. I was explaining this to one of my, my players, my captain, actually, of uh, Greenville Triumph here that I coach and manage, and... Uh, I played in joking around towards the end of the training session because it was a light training session. Uh, we did a heavy load work in, uh, in terms of physical periodization. We did a really heavy load day that day. And at the end, we just did five aside. And so they need an extra player. So I came in as a neutral. And I said, you're not allowed to tackle me, you know, joking around. And my captain goes, why not? You're on the pitch. And I said, oh, my God, <laughs> not, we're not going back there, are we? And they said, go back where? So I had to share the story with them. Um, uh, Ron Atkinson played in, in this five aside, and you all know what Nigel Pearson's like, <laughs> and I'm sure somebody else probably told you this story, but I, my jaw dropped to the ground <laughs> when he came through him, double leg tackle, and lifted him off the ground, bang, and I was like, holy hell, what's he doing? What's a gaffer? <laughs> and uh, he's like and he picks him up and the ball starts going down the wing and you see him turn and he goes hey if you're going to be out here you got to take it son you know what i mean <laughs> and then, right away, and see going, all right yeah yeah, oh, yeah fair enough okay no no i see you <laughs> i was like wow that's unreal and then i thought Fucking, and nice was a nut job but all right he's got to take it so that was one of the stories but to answer your first question, I got along with Ron. I think he respected um, that I respected the opportunity that was given to me. Um, and you, like Sir Alex always said, and um, I've been very fortunate to get to know him even more uh, when I was commentating with like ESPN and Fox over here, I got to see him at the International Champions Cup. And we would share a glass of wine at times. We'd be staying at the same hotel. Um, and it's just like he said, and Ron was the same. It was about, you never forget who gives you that first chance of believing in you. And that, that's kind of how I was endearing to Ron. Now, Ron also had, he had his jovial side, but he also had his hard, you know, hard discipline side. And he would give you the freedom to find that. And, but he would also let you know, and if you weren't in line with everything else, he would let you know. So he had a, a, a good balance, I thought. And look, I was with the club for three years. I wanted it to be 33 years, um, to be fair. Um, 
but you can't control everything in the club situation. But with Ron, I, I really thought he prepared the team well. Winning this Rumblos Cup in 91, I, I learned a lot and I took a, a few of his tricks of the trade and how to manage and how to enjoy the moments, you know, and everybody said, oh, he's pink champagne and all that stuff. And I said, yeah, he does that. It's a little bit of a show, but underneath he's a very, very, very good guy. And um, I don't know. I had a good connection with him, to be fair. Cool. Vic, go, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm still reading yeah. from the Nigel Pearson story. Like, <laughs> oh, I, I tell you what, it was John. The tackle, it, it, by the way, <laughs> it was, um, it was John Newsom who, who said at the time, he said that Nigel Pearson would, would sit there at each other, going, "I'm gonna fucking knock him. I'm gonna absolutely <laughs> knock him on his." And it was, a, it was completely on purpose. And that, um, that was actually quite good. That was quite good. Was yeah, good. I've, I've been practicing for the last two weeks. <laughs> Go on, Vic. John, I was just going to ask you, obviously, you're talking about your youth and coming into football and everything else. And we've done our research and we know that your son and daughter both happen to be very, very impressive footballers in their own right. And I just want to know something here. It's kind of a family grudge that I have. So is that genetically inherited or is that from you forcing them to play constantly in the garden? Because my dad was a professional footballer. And I ain't. So I just wondered, like, is it ever missing a gene or is the was it just more and more effort? Was oh, it dad got home from work, dad forced us to do penalty shootouts all afternoon? No, no, I was never forced. My wife played as well. She played at the same university I went to and then she played um, both uh, semi-pro in the U.S. as well as playing at Wednesday Ladies and she played at... Um, God, what was it? Ilkinston, I think it was. Rangers. Yeah. And, uh, oof, wow, but that was interesting back in the day. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I was never forced. Um, you know, all three of my kids play. I have two daughters. My youngest one, Lily, she's 20. She's at Elon University playing. Uh, she's a good holding number six. Very, very uh, unbelievable passer of the ball. And Lauren, and, yeah, she played at Clemson, which is not about half an hour from here. And uh, Ian, yeah, of course, at Dundee United and uh, enjoying his football there. We never forced him, Vic. It was never that. And I think we always kind of, as young parents, you always kind of think, oh, wouldn't it be great if all my kids can play and they can do what mom and dad did and stuff like that. But I think it got to a stage where Ian was probably, I think I want to say six years old. And... He was, he was a good footballer, a good little footballer, always technically clean, very, very good technique. Uh, but it was funny with Cindy, she had less patience than I did, where she was like, hey, he's got to really get after the game. Let's go. He's got to show the desire. And I said, he's six. <laughs> down. Um, but later, it was interesting because they just gravitated. It was on the telly. It was, we would all have fun watching games and breaking down games, but it was never like a chore for them. I never said you need to do this today in the garden or you better get your touches. I never said that. I just said the ball's there if you want it. Ian always went out. Always. Always went so outside. It's genetic then. It's genetic. So technically I need to have a word with my mum because well, there is a book as well. The gene right code. There, There's it? a gene code book you can look at as well. <laughs> like that. So we, we might have to have further discussions, Vic, on another <laughs> Zoom call. Um, maybe it is. I'm not sure, but I think we, what we did was we allowed them to have the love for the game and the passion of the game, what we did. Because both my wife and I are very passionate people about the game. And I, but I always said to them, just what Cindy said too, you know, if you're going to be a teacher, be the best teacher you can be. If you're going to be a fireman, be the best fireman. If you're going to be a policewoman, be the best policewoman. Whatever it is, just be passionate about what you do. So that's kind of how we were. Just as a side note then, with your son being at Dundee, do you think you'll ever convince him to move a little bit further south? Oh, I, th I think he's uh, ready. He's waiting for the opportunities. <laughs> well, yeah. It depends, we, it we, depends on certain, I think we'd have him at the moment. Uh, <laughs> coaches and leadership and of clubs, you know, and what their interest is. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's enjoying it. Just signed another two-year deal. Obviously, getting promoted to the Premiership mm -hmm. in Scotland is good and getting to play against Celtic and Aberdeen and Rangers. And it's fantastic. You know, there's so many great history in the game there. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, there's been conversations. People have asked me. There's been different agents overseas that have asked me if he would be interested in coming to the championship at some point and proving himself. And um, we, I, might I be, it, we might be in League One, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, huh? it, does he fancy League One? I mean, away at Accrington <laughs> might be nice. I don't know. Accrington <laughs> Stanley. <laughs> That's all, yeah. would he? Uh, no, I don't think he would. <laughs> um, but I think it's 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 funny because even managing you you, you try to manage the players, um, and you have to have a connection individually to them to see what what their goals are and desires and where they want to be, and so how are you going to get there? And Ian so was a player that that has been more of a late bloomer, but he's also had the desire and passion to fight through and and get through adversity to to prove who he is and what he's all about. Um, and so we'll see. He's on part of a journey now. You never know where football is going to take you. Oh, well, I'll, I'll take that on a beautiful segue um, <laughs> there, John. Um, so this is going to take you back a few years, and obviously you're, you're dressed in the right attire. So um, <laughs> as we all, we all know that Wembley is the home of football. So as an American... Um, what was it like walking out in front of, well, 80,000 fans uh, in a cup final for obviously the best team in the world? Um, so, yeah, just, just the atmosphere. I mean, for all of us, we'd, we'd love to put the shirt on for Wednesday, but obviously in a cup final, mm-hmm. and that would be a very rare occasion. So, yeah, what, what was it like for yourself, the, the, the cup final walking out? Um, I, I think, well, actually to take off of what you just said, Ash, I think putting the jersey on, number one, putting the kit on is, is the biggest uh, uh, feeling of pride. Um, when you get called upon to, to represent your club, it's brilliant. When you represent your nation as well, um, it's brilliant, it, but it's different. Uh, and, and the moments that you take in football, um, I consider myself extremely lucky, extremely fortunate that I had those, those experiences. But the walking out, I, I don't know if I can actually express the words, um, how that feels. Um, it, it's realizing you're actually walking through your own dream, to be honest with you. And it's, it's, it's the hardest. Oh, Dan, Dan, keep them in, Dan, keep them in. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to separate it and realize that this is reality and that you are actually standing in the tunnel um, behind those Wizard of Oz doors that closed behind you at Wembley and, and that you're getting an opportunity to walk on this hallowed history part of English football. And uh, it was the best experience of my life, to be honest with you. It was, it was one of them. It's up there for sure as almost the best because I had grown up watching videos and, and seeing the games and watching people climb the steps to Wembley Way. And um, here I was playing against some of my heroes, by the way. And Brian Robson was on my wall when I was younger, Um, you know, and uh, and competing against the likes of Steve Bruce and all of these guys uh, was pretty amazing against Manchester United. So it's almost like the stars all just aligned perfectly, you know, for Sheffield Wednesday in the history of the club as well. I mean, because I can imagine that being a huge career high for you, because obviously internationally, yeah. Manchester United had a had a, a huge international fan base even back then. You know what I mean? In the in the in the turn of the nineties, so so like mm-hmm. you say, to have pictures of Brian Robson and maybe not Steve Bruce on your wall. Yeah. Um, oh no, his nose was on one picture, <laughs> his head was on another. Yeah, yeah, um, he, had, he had one side of his face going to the shops, the other coming back with a change. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it, it really is. It was realizing that I had competed and worked so hard and blood, sweat and tears and everything in training to culminate in an opportunity to walk on that pitch. I didn't feel like I deserved it uh, on the bus ride over, to be honest with you. I I tell, you, tell, like tell I was... us about that bus ride, John, because, you know, like Steve mentioned it when we were off air earlier on about we had a uh, there was a, a video, a VHS video. Kids, if you remember them, they, they uh, <laughs> they're old school DVDs. Ben's got no idea. Ben's got no idea. I doesn't even know what an old DVD is. I, I was getting there. I, I was going to do the levels. 
And you know what I mean? I was going to ask him why the save icon is, is what it is, but you don't know. But, uh, but John, there was a video going around at the time telling us about, you know, showing us what it was like on the coach and Stan Boardman was there and all the rest of it. Just tell us about that day, just, just from start to finish. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty interesting. Again, it goes back to, um, you know, what, what's the, this, I guess, the coaching of, of approach and philosophy of Ron Atkinson. Um, he knew that it was going to be a stressful situation. Uh, part of what Ash was asking me as well was like, what was that, you know, feeling for me? But it was also like, can I always be a player that thought about the big picture of everything? So taking in everything, how do you, how do you really write that script? where Ron Atkinson gets sacked at Manchester United, goes to Wednesday, has a club that gets relegated, brings him back up, and here we are playing in the cup final against his old club that sacked him. I mean, honestly, that is just ridiculous. It's and, absolutely and ridiculous. in that interim, got kicked up in the air by Nigel Pearson as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. And recovered. <laughs> he still was able to chase a squirrel across at Hyde Park um, in the preparations. Um, but it was the bus ride. I mean... I think there was tension. I think there was pressure. Uh, Ron did a good job building up to that, that day and that bus ride coming in. He planned every moment. He planned every training session exactly how he wanted it. Because you could tell his experience, he was drawing from that experience and his leadership was coming through. Uh, to be fair, we were, just, we were just puppets for him on the day. And if we carried out our mission, then we were going to be successful. But he believed we were going to beat him. He really did. That bus ride, Stan, I couldn't understand a word he was saying sometimes. <laughs> he was such a scouse. Um, but it was great because he kept people light and he kept us laughing and joking around. Um, but at the same time, there was in the back of your mind, there was always that stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. What are we, what's our objective today? What do we have to get done? And um, it, was such a, it was just such a, I think it was a good environment to then what Ash was asking about getting into that stadium and walking out on that pitch. It, it kind of, it was a building process and it was, you think about it, it was genius. Honestly, two nights before the game, we had a, a little dinner get together, you know, like enjoying ourselves. And I'm thinking to my, as an American, I'm like, what are we doing? Keep that beer away from me. Don't touch that champagne. Don't even look at me. You know, everybody else can have fun. Players don't touch anything. But he just, he wanted to make it an occasion. He made it in a real occasion. And it wasn't just a game. You get out, you finish the game, win or lose, who cares, you move on. It was enjoy every moment you can. And he, he really, it was brilliant. I thought it was fantastic. Do you think that, sorry, sorry Dan, do you think that helped um, the players, uh, him having that mentality? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, to be fair, each, each one of us has, a uh, different emotional control and emotional intelligence in situations when you're pressured. And some players have it more than others. In order to get a full team on board to buy in uh, that we're going to go and beat Manchester United at the end of a season that just we just got promoted. So you're on this little bit of a roller coaster and the emotional highs and the lows that come with football and everything else. But to be able to get everybody on that bus, everybody in that team, everybody in that dressing room on one page to buy in is an amazing accomplishment. And yes, it helped. Without a doubt, it helped. It helped. It helped you to recognize the stressful moments to be able to, you know, you could put them in categories and, and figure out why am I stressed, but then have a laugh with with a John Sheridan or have a laugh with a, a Danny Wilson or, or a Hursty or somebody like that, but then say, okay, here it goes. We're crossing the line now. Now it means business. And just being able to do that has been fantastic. And I, I thought it was brilliant. It really was. Preparation was excellent. I'd like to take you back now and another career I while you're at Wednesday and just really ask you what you were thinking when you took that touch out of your feet at the baseball ground against Derby County and decided to shoot. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think it was, God, I think that was my third game uh, for Wednesday. And um, never played right back before. Um, Roland Nielsen, who was my roommate and friend and 
you know, who was a great player to look up to and, and gain advice from, uh, had blown out his knee, as you guys know, the history there, and uh, gave me an opportunity to step in. And when the gaffer asked me to play in that position, he was like, have you ever played there before? I said, of course I have. You know, and then he walked away. I was like, holy, <laughs> are you sure? Um, and uh, it was kind of, um, it was a guided discovery, to be fair. And without the teammates that I had, and that's what made that team such a tight team. It was a very really close team. And, and some English players don't know how to open up about their emotions, you know, they're really tight. Um, but I think if you ask them now, reflecting back, and I, I spoke to Kingy about five weeks ago, I FaceTimed him out of the blue. And he was shocked, <laughs> but it was, uh, we were reminiscing about a lot of things. And he was saying how special it was, you know, for that team, the way that um, they can accept you and who you are once you show them that you're a good footballer. And that night, scoring that goal at Darby, um, I don't know what I was thinking. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, I kind of do in a way because I was excited to play and I was getting that start and I was getting those, those opportunities. And when the ball got switched over to me, I remember taking a snapshot up the pitch, just looking quickly before it came. And my first touch was forward out of my feet big. And then my second touch was even bigger because I realized it was about 30 yards of space. And I couldn't believe how much space I had coming from the right back position there. And at that point, I didn't know what the F to do with the ball. So I said, why not? <laughs> Would you encourage your right backs as a coach to do that? Sort of oh, I do, actually. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. It's Good. not. It's I, encourage, not I encourage all my players to do that. Yes. <laughs> Because it isn't just an average goalkeeper as well. This has gone past Peter Shilton. Oh, he was crap, man, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> no caps, no experience under him. Yeah. Didn't know what he was doing. No, I tell, I tell you what, John. Before I before I pass over to Dave, I'm just going to interject with a little side question here. Now, when uh, when I actually we, we were there, we went to uh, went to Marseille to watch England. Uh, well, we went down there during the, during the Euros and before we got tear gas and all the rest of it. It was a good day out. Like um, <laughs> we, uh, I got talking to a, a German guy, and he was what we were watching the England Wales game, and he actually said that the problem with England over the years has not been uh, that we played Paul goals on the left or or that we didn't play properly. The perception for the last 30 years from other countries has, be, has been that our goalkeepers have been shite. Like, we, we make talismans out of people like Peter Shilton. Was he really that good? Was he any good, really? Have you just asked that question, Danny? I, I, I'm telling you. I'm pretending that my screen froze and I didn't hear it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 you know what? I, who says that we are uh, allowed to answer that question? I don't know. I don't um, the know Germans, and, and they tend to beat <laughs> us a lot, to be fair, John. No, to be fair, you know I mean? but, but also, you, you, it's a lot of the players back in the day when you compare them. You know, we, we look at a Lionel Messi, and people are telling me, like, Hoxie, was he better than Pele? I grew up being a ball boy for Pele at the Cosmos, and, and I was able to get a big hug from Pele in 94, going out in the world. Oh, hold on a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you were a ball oh. boy for Pele? Yeah. Let's go there. That's it. That's it. That's, that's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I was saying to your point was, All right. you, you people ask questions about, were they really that good back in the day? Or was the football slow? Or was mm -hmm. the defending there? Or were they not as athletic? They, of course, the game was different. Um, Peter Shilton was, you know, respected, you know, not just as a, as a goalkeeper, but as a leader, you know, I think in the game, you know, that, that actually pushed the game on to the next levels. And yeah, my answer is he was one of the best in the world that I scored against in the upper 90. So there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let me, let me get that random German man now. Let, where is he now? Where is he now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dave, get, get me out of this hole where right. I've called Peter Shilton shit. <laughs> uh, right. John, I'd put this question in a nice flowery kind of Wednesday way, but I'm going to ask it blunt. You mentioned about your kids have been brought up on football. It's always on the telly. They've had a chance to be exposed to it. They've seen it, and, and that may be where their loves came from it. It's not going to be the same because 
as you've kind of grown up watching football, you've had your exposure to it, but this is before the Premier League. This is before Sky TV because not everybody appreciates that football existed before Sky TV. Sky certainly don't believe that's the case. So are we better now with people being able to see football and if football's getting moved from three o'clock kickoffs because the world can see football because everybody can get exposed to it? Or have we lost something from when you were growing up watching football where if you wanted it, you'd go and you'd go and look at it. You weren't overexposed to it. So who had it better growing up, you or your kids? Mm. Wow, that's a great yeah. question. Yeah. Test him, there's guests here, Dave. I know, I'm a bugger, aren't I? <laughs> uh, I would, you I tell would... he's a copper. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that our generation uh, growing up had a, a massive understanding and appreciation of the history of the game. Mm. And I think this generation gets exposed to the game through social media and platforms, uh, technology, and as you say, seeing the game on a consistent basis. And it's almost gotten to a point, I had this discussion with my dad last week, uh, my dad's 82, and he's just like, oh, I, you know, I've got so many games on, I can just switch this one off and change it and put on this one and put on that one. And he goes, and we were talking, I said, like, yeah, is that a good thing? Mm -hmm. And it, to, to your question, to your point. And he goes, no, I, I don't think it is. He goes, I like when it's hard for you to see games mm -hmm. and you love it more. And it's more exciting when you do and you, you feel the passion for it. So I guess we've lost a little bit of that to answer your question properly. Um, and and uh, But on the good side, on the positive side, I think we do have a little bit more exposure to the game, which is great. Wider we're audience. Able, yeah, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we're exposed in, in Serie A, the Bundesliga. You know, you could see uh, Ligue 1 if you needed to in, in games and on different channels. And so I think it's there for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas beforehand, it was hard. You know, my dad was listening to my games on shortwave radio. Mm -hmm. So does that keep it in perspective? Yes, Absolutely. I'm 190 years old. So screw you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the wireless. <laughs> Before I uh, before I go to Vic, we've just had a couple of uh, we've had a couple of questions from some some guys on Facebook, and some of these questions are actually really good. Um, have we asked about the Wembley goal against the Blades? Uh, no, we haven't. We've not we've not touched on that at all. And uh, another one, John, uh, just to get you going. Do you think you'll ever fancy the Wednesday manager's job one day? Oh, um, the the first part of the question was which goal against the Blades? Uh, have you asked about the Wembley goal against the Blades? I don't I don't know. Uh, you know. I don't know which one that is. Is that Chris Bottles? Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess it, I guess it was. I, I, you know, I, <laughs> maybe. I, 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 you know, it, it, you were there for it. But this, the second one about yeah. being, um, about being, you know, Sheffield Wednesday coach, manager, head coach, what you know, whatever they want to call it. I mean, bear in mind, John, we quite we quite like you. You know what I mean? Is is that well, something? Hey, I mean, Danny hey, Wilson. All those, acting, all those acting skills and lessons worked. <laughs> um, I would say this uh, in terms of managing. Um, I'm willing to accept opportunities to manage um, if, if I feel that I'm going to be challenged in the right way and I'm going to grow as a manager. Oh, wait a bit. Oh, challenge. you'll be challenged. <laughs> oh. I, oh, by the way, I've watched the last three games. Oh, <laughs> even not. Uh, really, that. I've gone in and out. I've gone in and out. Um, I would say this. Uh, look, I mean, it, it, it's right. I mean, it, if you get opportunities and you get, you get asked, you know, to be considered for jobs, yeah, I'd be certainly uh, open to that. I think it would be great. I'm still a young manager um, as a head coach. Uh, and, you know, we call a head coach here, the manager overseas, but I'm also a sporting director here. I've built two clubs from the ground up in this country over the last four years. I love doing that. I love growing the game that way and giving opportunities in different platforms. And, uh, and I'm trying John, to grow John, the game in this country. John, stay, stay there. Keep, keep doing that. <laughs> Uh, just, just, just for the time being. Like I said, we quite like you right now. You know what I mean? Right. Danny Wilson jumped his knackers on the chopping block. He went to shit. Honest, just, <laughs> carry on doing what you do. <laughs> well, we, we could, we could, we could do with some, some help with the academy and uh, mm. growing, growing the game there. Oh, can we uh, just? Can you not just bring your boots? 
Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'd be afraid that Nigel Pearson would be on the sideline. <laughs> He'd take me out in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Vic, take, take, take us into your bit, because this is my favourite bit. I enjoyed this bit. Well, I'm, I'm meant to be doing my quick fire. You never told well, me. Well, no, you had a question you first, know? didn't you? you a, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, You've thrown me now. Um, <laughs> happens all the time. It's my boy's good looks, Sean. I need to find my questions. Just bear no, with just me. Someone ask else him the, ask him the one about right. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on Vic's question now because we we're, were so prepared for this, John. Um, so Vic had a question earlier on that she'd quite like to ask. Uh, you touched upon it earlier on about FaceTime in Kingy. Are you still in touch with any of the legends from that squad? Oh yeah, that was it. <laughs> I am actually. Yeah. Um, touch me. I, always, I was always close to uh, Wadler. Um, you know, Chris and I kind of connected right away. Uh, when he came to the club, uh, yeah, I, I'm still briefly in touch with uh, guys like Colin Palmer and Hursty. Uh, Sheridan is a, a little bit of a hermit crab, so it's hard to get a hold of him once in a while. I think he's um, just got a new job today, yeah, yesterday, Ireland, didn't he? Yeah, I think he's got a job in Ireland, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. got himself a job. He's in Ireland now, if you want to get hold of him. Obviously, yeah. I'll, I'll track him down for you, pal. Is he really? Yeah. Waterford. Waterford. Are you Waterford. taking the mix? Yeah, you're yeah, taking yeah. the piss out of me here. No, no, that's no, that's true. That is that is the most organised random wind up ever. If we're all saying, yeah, yeah, it's a water Waterford manager. Yeah, of course he is. <laughs> what a great group you are. I hope you've done it. I haven't seen that. Has that been yesterday? That's it. Uh, text, text, him. text him. Say, oi, what's happening here? What's, uh, uh, yeah, give me a job. Oi, oi, Chris Packett. What are you that, doing? That, that's Chris another Packett. exclusive hey, announcement. Hey, Chris Packett, hey, hey. That's all he did all the time. <laughs> um, that's great. He's uh, yeah, I'm glad because uh, when I was visiting over there, he was uh, God, who was he with? Oldham at the time. Then he went to Fleetwood briefly. Um, yeah, so who's he with in Ireland? Waterford, Waterford, Waterford. FC, I think. Hey, really? Mm. Okay, that's great. Good for him. Preseason friendly for you, right there. There you go. Yeah, he's <laughs> afraid to play me though. <laughs> they don't want to play I've asked them I've asked Wednesday come over they don't want yeah. to play I found my questions but they have my notes for Chris Bart Williams above so I'll try not to you know, get too they, confused they both played in the 90s they both played for <laughs> Nottingham Forest as well just just oh, oh come that. on it's probably got a story about <laughs> Ryan Clough oh, that <laughs> that, that's one that's one player who does not reach out to anybody Chris Bart he's even in the same country as me <laughs> <laughs> he so is we surprisingly were difficult to get hold of, to be fair, actually, yeah. John. He's, uh, he's, he's like hen's teeth, which is the nice way <laughs> yeah. of saying rocking or shit. Go on, Vic, get me out of the He has his wife's holes. contact details, Fudge. Didn't he get in touch with him through his wife? So Yeah, I, I keep sending her nudes. She's not. Like <laughs> <laughs> She'll be able to put you in touch. Uh, John, my, my questions are just like a few little ones that are just kind of I want to say one word answers, but feel free to elaborate. But obviously, we've just said about who did you, who do you still speak to? But who was your like best friend at the time? Obviously, you said you roomed with Roland Nielsen. Which, oh my god! Uh, <laughs> I think that I think that's one of Vic's. Um, uh, no, I'm not saying the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's he's uh, pretty he's gonna hot. Get pretty hot. Um, <laughs> that's going to keep a lonely lady very happy yeah uh, Chris Waddle I guess close to Chris yeah I mean we uh, kind of hit it off straight away yeah it was uh, it was easy and then uh, unfortunately he was very good at inviting me to the dev um, out, out where he is and uh, that it just took off from there oh yeah well I'm friends with his daughter Brooke so I'll say yeah hi. Brooke's brilliant yeah she's still singing <laughs> She is. She went on The Voice, actually, over here. Um, she didn't get through, but she's still, really? yeah, she's still gigging and doing really well. I know. Chris, I, there's a story for you. Chris and I were her roadies one time. We set up a, 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 a gig she did in London. Brilliant. I don't so, know if she's so, actually watching. So could, I can't see. She normally does. So It could have been, it could have been Waddle and Harks with Diamond no, Lights. That been <laughs> oh, dear God, I saw those videos. My God. I can't teach him how to dance and sing at the same time. <laughs> He's got no rhythm whatsoever. <laughs> Typical white man does not <laughs> at all. Apart of apart from when he gets on the pitch. Oh, yeah. Get it. Yeah. Well, you put a ball in there. He's mad. He's there. Yeah. And um, so, who was the best player that you played with then? Best player I played with on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, or, or just God. in general, John, to be fair. I mean, if you want to chuck Alexi Lalas in there, I mean, we're, we're not going to jump. <laughs> not your question, Fudge. All right, well, I'll just... <laughs> oh, <John Fudge. laughs> Let's talk to this guy. Lex, Lex is very, very talented with a guitar. Oh. I'm growing uh, a facial hair. I would say... Um, God, wow, that's a great question. Does Best be... talented player. Does being a ball boy count? Because I'm sure <laughs> there might be a player that you mentioned earlier. That <laughs> Some Brazilian guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you know, it's funny because, you know, when we get asked that question about, you know, is that player a best player for you? It's more on the attacking creative side, right? We all, who scored the goals? So, I mean, Wadler was probably the best player when he came from Marseille in that second year. I mean, he was just miles above, you know, he really was. I'd have to say um, Sheridan with his touch and his vision and the midfield was brilliant um, and his calmness on the ball. And Hursty was probably one of the most exciting strikers that I had seen in a long time, both footed, balanced, quick, aggressive, good in the air, unbelievable engine. I just could not believe that he didn't go to Manchester United. I, I don't think he can. I don't think he can. Yeah, I don't think he's ever... Can I just drop um, a little subtle hint as well in the background? Just like. Have you not? Have you not seen any, the background there? Any mention oh. coming to Mark Wright? Who's that in the back? I'm sorry. Mark Wright. Right. He's every. In fact, he's here as well. Is he? Oh, there? Brady. Yeah, Brady. I've got, I've got him here. here. Is he here? Is he here? Come on, John. <laughs> Were you ever devastated? The final, kept... There he is. Did we ever we devastated managed... that you didn't get one of these? Uh, Brighty's brilliant, by the way. Actually, I, I'm in touch with Brighty quite a bit. And it's funny you said that because when he was in the crowd at, at the Palace game when they were losing, yeah, they kept showing him with the facials. <laughs> I recorded him off my telly and sent it to him. I said, hey, we feel for you, pal. Hang in there. The, the problem was, like, John, the reason he was nightmare. doing that was because I was giving him a lift home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was left in the stadium on his own that night. Well, that's because I love his hair, by the way. He's growing the, ba the hair out and everything. Um, now, Brighty was class. He was a good player as well. But I mean, Hurst, he was just. Uh -huh. I mean, you, you're talking he about then. Like you were talking about. I mean, like Hurst, Waddle, and Sheridan, all had natural talent. You know what I mean? They yeah. were they were born gifted footballers. But a lot of people always have a soft spot for your your roommate Roland Nilsson about about his attitude towards fitness and and all the rest of it. And you know, was he was he the first of a different breed? coming into the Premier League at that time? Oh, yeah. In terms of his fitness and focus and dedication, yeah. I mean, he was – and it was just his demeanour, the way he carried himself. I mean, he was very soft-spoken. Um, you know, when he did uh, – when he gave you his opinion and views on something, you always – it was it's kind of like everybody just stopped in the room, you know, the way he spoke. And, uh, uh, yeah, he was, he was quality. Yeah, really, really, really quality player. Sorry, um, Vic, I, st I stepped on your questions there, didn't I? But I will on. say, though, I, from a leadership standpoint, Pearson was probably one of the best that I've been because around. Because he, he, he kicked Ronald kicked kicked the, the heart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, think, I just think he had, a, he had a great way, you know, what you, what you try to do in even in your coaching years and your managing years, what you try to do is have a balance for everything. And, and you have to understand how each individual ticks and what their background's from and who they are and how they learn and and how, what, what inspires him. And I think Nigel knew how, when to give you a good kick in the ass uh, and when to put his arm around you. And he was, uh, he was very good at it. Sorry, awesome. Vic, now, I don't think this one will be as, um, I don't think you'll have to put as much thought into this one. But obviously you've said you've watched us recently. Who would you say is our best player now? If you, oh. if you had to pick one. <laughs> and you can't choose Stephen Fletcher or Forrest Dieri because they've gone. The chef. <laughs> Yeah, F uh, Fletcher was great. Forcieri was so creative, so technically gifted. Um, oh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can honestly. You know, know, to be fair, to be fair, <laughs> I don't think it would be. I I haven't watched enough to give you a proper opinion to stand that by. That was a that was a very that diplomatic, diplomatic answer, that John. <laughs> if it had been me, I'd have gone bank. <laughs> that's a reference. That's a reference from 19 years ago. You wouldn't have got that, Ben. <laughs> no, <I didn't>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who was the class clown when you were at Wednesday? Oh, Hursty. Mm -hmm. 
had to be Hersey. I mean, mm -hmm. Kingy, Kingy had his own humor. You know, he was, Kingy was funny. He had his laugh, his cracking jokes, and uh, he was just brilliant the way he was. But uh, Hersey was just funny, man. He, he, he would do it, like, even just walking up the tunnel. He would just be funny. Just before we even crossed the pitch, he was brilliant. Just just talking about, like, you, you said about me not knowing what VHS tapes are. I, I do. <laughs> I do. Because when, when I were a bit younger, I did have, like, the night, like 92, 93 season reviews and stuff. So <laughs> when you talk about practical jokers, you must have been up there, John, because I've seen a few things where I think it was when you'd gone to Europe and what have you, and... You were you, you got loads of sweets and chocolate saying it saying it with a kingy. I don't know if you remember that one. It's yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Kingy was always taking us to get the pies. You know, all the sausage and egg baps before training in the morning. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I like. I mean, look, I I I love to have fun in the game. Um, I think it's important to do that from a mental, um, you know, uh, perspective because. There, there is a lot of pressure on, on players. Um, and I think on a daily basis, it's what you put yourself through the grind and, and not just physical uh, preparation, but mental preparation and being part of a team. I think it's important to have fun off the field. And if you can have that balance, and I think it helps give you longevity in the game. So I was fortunate to be a pro for 14 years and, um, you know, come back to the States and help develop the league here in 96 and Major League Soccer and play here. Um, you know, for the seven years. And so I think uh, having a good attitude and having fun off the pitch is always great, but I got to be honest with you, man. Some of it, some of the pranks that were played by some of the boys there, I, I, it's not for uh, children's viewing. Uh, <laughs> They, that's, that's, why, that's why we have ash just to keep the kids away john you can tell us yeah if you okay want. yeah yeah so you, yeah we used to put pictures of uh, uh kingy above the fireplace to keep um, the kids away as well um but it was uh no it was a good team I, I think that's what made it so special though that team yeah we were we were talent but we were we were also so passionate and about everything about life and just living and just being with each other it was just amazing i mean it was a a connectivity that is probably hard to imagine that happened again, to be honest with you. That three years that I had there, God, it just, it was part, it was just the most important time of my life. It helped me grow up. It was fantastic. It really was. So uh, normally at this time in the interview, uh, just for the last yeah. five minutes, we're going to uh, what I call fans questions. I may or may not have made up, made them all up. But it's Why normally are you it's, doing it? it's normally a fucking nightmare from start to finish, John. I'll not lie. Um, so <laughs> what I'm going to go uh, now. The oh, first one you've already, you touched upon, to be fair. So I'm I'm going to change it a little bit. You know what I mean? What it was, I, I started with with you being the most notable absentee from the class class of the '91 reunion dinner. We've got to see some of the banter uh, between some of the players, and you've already touched upon David Hurst and Phil King. So I thought, you know what? I'll leave that one. You know what I mean? And what I want to know is. Who had the shittest haircut when you look back? Is it you or Phil King? <laughs> Probably me. Yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's what I had. Uh, <laughs> did you get did you get given any uh, any nicknames by the lads? Because I've noticed that you've you've kind of picked up a few a few um, colloquialisms like words like lads, and, I, and um, your little Yorkshire accent has crept out there a little bit. So you know. <laughs> Tell it. All right, Lord. Give me some all right, all right. <laughs> um, I was like Ben. <laughs> can I can I get that as my uh, message alert tone? Can somebody uh, record? <laughs> that? Yeah. Exactly. Um. Jeez. Wow. Did you get any, any any nicknames? Did they call you Captain America? Did you get called? Uh, oh. Yankee Doodle Dandy. Brilliant. Joking around. Brilliant. Top uh, Yeah. I mean, it was yeah nicknames. I mean, I. I do a very good Jim Carrey. So I did a lot of different Jim Carrey things. I mean, uh, Jim Carrey stole all my material from high school. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Out of it. Um, yeah. but, it's the uh, reason yeah. I've, I've literally got a Miami Dolphin shirt on. It's literally Jim Carrey movies of why I'm wearing this. Yeah. Oh, you really? That's <laughs> yeah, fantastic, yeah. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, no, he's brilliant. He's a creative, creative guy. So yeah, I would, uh, I don't, any other nicknames? 
Whew, things I can't I mean, share with I you. mean, bear in mind you were playing with John Sheridan and David Urs, so, you know, ones like Dickhead and Knobhead, you're not allowed <laughs> to stare. You know, because yeah, they're quite generic. Very for rarely was I called a knobhead, but I was called Chris Packett by Shares once in a while. Chris I didn't Packett. Get <laughs> I, I, can't, I, can't, I want to ask some people about that. Like, I'm going I'm to carry that forward, like the Nigel Pearson story. Did you get called a Chris, <laughs> yeah. Chris Packett? We'll get back to you on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll come back with that one. Um, uh, another one here. Were you ever secretly jealous of the way that the MLS used to take penalties? Would I? What? Secretly what? Yeah, so uh, I don't, I don't oh, know if you remember this. Line dribble thing. Oh, it was yeah, awful. So instead of taking a, a, a PK, yeah, uh, yeah, the shootout, shootout, shootout. They, shootout, they, they yeah. used to they used to dribble it from the halfway line in the. Yeah, oh, that's, what they did the that's what they did in the, the North American Soccer League when Pele mm -hmm, yeah. was playing, and I was a yeah. ball boy. So they would do thirty five yards out, five second rule, and the big clock, and they do it in the corner, and we did it here for the first year or two. It was shocking. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, uh, some, I'll some of the videos are brilliant on YouTube. Oh, I love them. I love They're them. great. Um, this this one's quite uh, quite quite pressing. This one, uh, who would win in a fight, John Sheridan and his street smarts, or Roland Nilsson and his straight straight up fitness? Oh, wow. Yeah, I know, right? I know. Uh, like, there'd, be, there'd, to... there'd be a lot of blood. There'd definitely yeah. be a lot of bleeding. I, um, I, I really had to think about that one because I feel that I, I would know, say Roland, Roland Nilsson. I'd Roland say Roland Nilsson. Nilsson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, yeah. He's probably got you know, full of blade. Yeah, especially now. Shez is uh, he, he walks on his toes. He's not as mobile. <laughs> <laughs> he'd pull out uh, a palm key or something like that from his IKEA furniture. Yeah, if we're yeah. Going to be, if we're going to the Swedish thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, this this one's really important, John. This one. Uh, do you know how to change the battery in a Audi A4 key fob? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I do actually. Can you, can, you, uh, can you do me a video? Because I'm literally locked out of my car. Um, uh, and, then, and then last one, based on the story you told us earlier on. Um, did you ever serve chips and gravy in New Jersey? <laughs> oh, you were that bastard. <laughs> right. Do we have to put do I have to put it in and hold a button and turn? Is that what yeah, I have yeah, to do? Put the button down right here and you pull that out, and then you you actually do that. Fuck uh, oh. oh, yeah. You can show, show me that later on when we're off air. I, <laughs> I genuinely need to learn how to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, did you ever serve chips and gravy when you were in New Jersey in the uh, in the chippy when you were 14? Uh, I, I served, uh, I was a caterer. I used to prepare the fish throughout the day, um, load up the fish, load up the fryers, all the oils, and I would go to a church and I would cook 400 dinners with about six of my mates. Jesus, that's, uh, that's, that's better than working at a Venus restaurant in Dayton. Yeah, it, it was fantastic. <laughs> it was unbelievable. John, just stay on the line for us, but I'm going to say bye-bye to Facebook land. Thank you so much for everybody for joining us. Once again, big round of applause, Mr. John Harks. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Victor. The Wednesday week. It's blue, it's white, it's effing dynamite.